Okay, we are live. Welcome to Tamara's Closet today. I'm really excited to be here today. I have a very special guest with me again from South Africa. And he was actually a guest on here five years ago on my show. And today he's returning with some really more fabulous work. He is a former defense attorney and now full-time artist who is a brilliant sculptor as well as a brilliant painter. He's a second time finalist for the Global Art Award 2020. So over the past two years, his work has raised more than 1 million Rand to provide talented South African scholars with exceptional educational and leadership development. So give a warm welcome to artist Janko de Bear. Are you with me, Janko? Thank you so much for the great introduction. <laughs> well, you are welcome. I'm so glad that you're here today and that we got everything worked out. Um, yeah. so we're just going to jump right into it, Janko. Can you hear me good? I can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Okay, good. I kind of wanted to just go back to, you know, when you were an attorney, because uh, I, I, I didn't ask you this years ago, do you feel like you ever found inspiration from your experiences as a defense attorney that kind of come into play into your art? And even uh, today? No, so interesting enough. So also in South Africa, um, we don't have, we've got defense attorneys, but I think what, what I was, was an advocate, which is uh, someone that specializes in litigation, uh, more along the lines um, of your English system that's got solicitors and barristers. So we've got a differentiation between the two, but in all equal terms, it boils down to a defense attorney, I agree. So I don't know, um, if I must be really honest with you, inspiration wise i don't think i got real inspiration for my art uh, from being a defense attorney it's more uh, I, I actually used my art as an escapism uh, i couldn't wait uh, after the day of delving into people's problems to be able to actually get back home or get back to my studio and then go into stuff that i really truly love um, you know and th that back then it was only sculpting so from a business point of view i think Law has definitely taught me a lot, so it has helped me to deal with the business side of the art world, for sure. Right. Well, you know, I, I ask that because I, I know, I, you know, I know several attorneys and um, I work for, for one from time to time. And, you know, it, it, is, it's, it is a creative job, especially if you're a trial attorney, you know, if you're in the courtroom. So Absolutely. that's kind of... Yeah, you have to be creative. So. I mean, I fully really, really enjoyed it. It was it was a fun part of my life. Um, and yes, it, it can definitely be creative with a different side of your brain. Um, but, you know, I think it, one should just use your brain in unison uh, to the best of your own advantage. And in my way, I think it's better to use my brain uh, creating art. You know, So it's all about how you and why, how you use it. Yeah, but but when we talked the other day, you said you missed some aspects of it from time to time. Or? Yeah, I suppose. Uh, I mean, I still help out family and friends uh, with, with with legal issues if I've got time. But I suppose what I what I truly miss about <laughs> being an advocate um, is the long lunches that, um, that 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 contains copious amounts of wine. Um, that was amazing. So that's what <laughs> we did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, at least you're honest. <laughs> oh, that's good. Well, you know, you've recently started doing a lot more paintings if I've watched you over the years. And, and um, I just want, I was curious if, because you've also been doing a lot of traveling, and I was wondering if this was related to some of your recent travels that got you inspired to do more paintings. So uh, traveling definitely um, inspires me in a, a lot of ways, um, but has it inspired me to start painting or create more paintings? I don't think so. Um, painting for me started more along the lines of um, being a sculptor and the process of being a sculptor has got long periods where the artist himself is is not necessarily involved in the process. For instance, um, if you if you start casting bronzes from your work, there's a whole period where your your mold will be in a in a casting foundry, 
and you will sit maybe for uh, two to three weeks at a time in your studio with just waiting for the bronze to be finished so that you then can again come back and do the patina that's the colors and stuff that you put on it so to keep yourself creatively busy as an artist um, i thought to also push my painting skills or actually to see what i can do and in the process developed it spending a lot of time you know as any skill i think there's a whole myth that you are born creatively um, or you're born a person that can paint I think it's 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 like anything in life. You have to put in the hours and the practice. And as you put in the hours and the practice, you get better and better. Um, and all of a sudden, boom! You sit with something that you actually enjoy uh, making and can make money of. So yeah, for me, it was incorporating it. Um, also, I think as an artist, there's no point in just being um, only a sculptor or only a painter or only a musician. You know, um, I think. Of late, people have changed into such a way where even musicians become fine artists and uh, sculptors become painters and painters become sculptors. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a whole, you need to almost like encourage yourself uh, and experiment in all the genres in life um, and yeah, practice every single aspect that there is possibly to practice in art. Yeah, I think so. I agree with you because I remember when I interviewed you five years ago and you were mostly doing the sculptures, you had done a few paintings and I had found some on the um, on your Facebook page and talked to you about them. And, and I remember telling you, I hope you do more of that because I really liked what you had done back then. And so I, I am glad, I'm glad that you're doing a variety of things. You know, so, but I want you to go ahead and talk about your your new series, sub subjectivity of with your mixed media paintings, and and share some of the meaning and influence by them. You, I'm gonna bring on your screen share here. Let's see, because they're just so beautiful. Thank you so much. So I'll just keep it on this on this image for now. But um, so my my series on subjectivity basically started off as an expansion of my sculpture series, also titled Subjectivity, which was to an extent uh, a, an exploration of putting yourself in the viewer of your art's mind and how they perceive it. And uh, which also later uh, also like expanded into uh, my eldest series. But you know, so the, the, the expansion is basic. I use my, my sculptures um, as the subject matter as well or the subject and then the subject matter i try to uh, use more expressionalism and uh, abstractism which eventually then evolved into what my current series is um which also quite interestingly enough you know uh, with this whole COVID that hit us um, the whole world um, especially south africa with our extreme lockdown situation which we had so from March, uh, we our whole country was pretty much shut down, and um, yeah, everything was closed down. And I started on this series, uh, which I now t uh, term untitled, because then again, uh, yeah, to give every single piece a title, I think um, becomes superfluous to a certain extent. Um, a, the meaning of a piece is in the viewer's own eyes; it doesn't necessarily need to be named anything. So in any event, um, so then I started venturing into expressionism and um, more abstractism. And then also um, um, uh, Fauvism, which was uh, originally created by, uh, I believe, Henry Matisse. Um, and that's the use of bold colors um, that you apply wet to a canvas. And it was in specifically when it started, it was in almost rebellion against the realistic approach of the 19th century, uh, where people painted with the exact skin tone colors, etc. So what he did was basically uh, redefine the fact that you can paint someone's face green and, uh, and it won't be seen as funny, you know, it would actually be seen as beautiful. So that's where that comes in. And I've been exploring that currently within the portraiture um, genre. And yeah, it's been going quite nice. So I'll try to take you through some of the works. Um, I love this one that you have on there. 
Yeah, so this one is actually from a friend of mine that lives in Canada um, that I, I used her, her face um, and as a model. She didn't give me consent uh, originally, but she's given me consent in the process. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, this one's it's all beautiful, talks. though. I love, I love, go back to that one. I love your choice of colors. Now, like in the oh, other one, one, yeah, that one, one, like, when you choose colors, like, because this is a real person here, does the colors have anything to do with that person, your, your, uh, no, not, not, not at all. Um, and that's okay. where I find um, where I find Henry Matisse's uh, fauvism quite interesting is the fact that you can change up skin tone. It doesn't necessarily need to represent uh, Caucasian pink or a um, African American's black or brownish color tones. You know, you can you can paint someone yellow um, and it still looks beautiful. You know, because. It, skin color tone is such a such a facade um, in front of our eyes. It's almost like the rule in front of our eyes, you know. Because um, if you actually look at the bottom of every person's feet on Earth, it is the same color. So I mean, yeah, um, me really? painting people, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I find, uh, I, yeah, for me, I don't. I, it does not reflect um, the person or the person's skin color at all. What I, 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 what I, I try and use colors that I personally find stimulating and complementing each other. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. So this one also with the, with the previous one, you know, with the circle and the triangle, it's almost touching on the idea of symbolism and uh, within painting. But for me, there's nothing sinister about it uh, or nothing behind the, the square or the, the circle. It's, uh, it, it literally, uh, it, it, it looks great. You know, it makes a visual impact. Um, and that's why I did it. I love that one. And I love the dark, the, how you darkened the eyes on that. That was really pretty. Yeah, it's almost like um, using makeup. <laughs> uh -huh. like on a, Painting, you know, it's like, and then bringing out the eyes. Um, so it's, yeah, it's interesting. Anyway, the next one is uh, also very similar to the previous one, but just uh, playing between the noughts and crosses idea of um, of of chance. Actually, um, that's how I see it, and that's also again within the subjectivity series um, of how people perceive things. It's either this way or that way. Uh, there's not really an in between. <laughs> Did was this a real model like the? So this model? is the same model as this model um, okay. that I, that I used. Um, the cool thing is, I mean, you you actually just need to use um, the eyes, nose, and mouth to create something on top of the abstract um, background, uh, which then becomes expressionism, and uh, which which I love. So it's basically portraiture, expressionism, and abstract was abstract expressionism based on portraiture, which is a nice combination to have. Um, and the following, um, this one um, is titled Jane Doe. The title came from, I actually put it on social media and I asked uh, all the followers to come up with a title. And this was the title that I chose eventually. You know, she's oh, got wow. this lost look in her eyes, but yet somehow, I don't know, like she's, that's that's what I love about her. She's like you can't really tell what the fuck she's thinking or saying, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. And I mean, this is the one that's that I got from you. It's in my studio, in my lobby, in my studio when you first come right. in. Yeah, and yeah. I just, I just when I saw her on social media, I just I was like, I gotta have her. And you had already sold the original, yeah. and um, but I just love it. It is just Thank you so much. yeah, she's beautiful. Thank you so much. So this is my, when I start when lockdown started, uh, as you will notice, said, there was a lot of faces, um, which I changed up by bringing in more of the body in the portrait um, itself and specifically including hands. You know, hands is such a, it's such an expressionistic form in itself. I mean, you can, just look at uh, all cultures all over the world. They use their hands quite a lot to say things and to do things, um, to express themselves. 
And by bringing in hands in a form like I'm doing at the moment, for me, is, is adding to the whole portraiture, expressionistic type of painting. Um, instead of just doing a face, which is beautiful in its own right, um, but also, yeah, I found it um, a bit more, almost more of a thinking, uh, to almost like get into the viewer to or let the viewer think more of the painting, almost let him think, what is that person thinking about scenario, you know, or so, yeah, mm -hmm. that's the idea. Well, um, I like the placement of her hand, I do. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's the to idea. Me it, Oh, it draws in, um, to, it, to me, it brings me into her eyes, the way her hand is placed. And I do wonder no. what she thinking. Exactly, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Then uh, go on. So, as I said, I didn't title, uh, give any names to this series, uh, which I like, because I want to almost let the viewer interpret it in their own way. Um, I think a lot of artists, by giving a title, to a name almost brainwashes the viewer immediately uh, into thinking in that direction instead of just leaving it open for them to interpret um, as they see fit you know um yeah so I, I that's why i love behind an untitled series it's much more open to the viewer yeah i agree yeah so now more hands i love the eyes in this one um mm -hmm. Again, suggestive, uh, not sure what she's thinking. Um, this is a part of, this was also almost an expansion of my um, subjectivity series, same model, but with hands included. It just creates a completely different um, scenario, you know. Um, but yeah, <laughs> this painting has been contentious. I've actually had people tell me that I'm stealing a cultural, things from people um, by including it in my work, which I couldn't understand at first, and I had to literally go and Google it, but um, it seems to be because I'm not black, um, I'm not allowed to do um, paintings with Afro air because it's considered stealing stealing from that culture and then gaining from it on my side. But, you know, I personally find it ridiculous because I myself, I'm definitely an African from the African continent. Um, you know, we've been living here for so long. Uh, it would be a pity if I do not consider myself as part of the continent. Um, yeah, I but, don't. I don't understand that either. I don't. I can't believe that was a problem. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Exactly. Thank you so much. I also love it. You know, and afros are amazing. I mean, my hair itself, if it's not dreadlocked, I can put it, push it into a beautiful. Beautiful afro, if I want. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, I, I would think they would love it that you're honoring their culture. I mean, that's how I see it. Exactly. But anyway, yeah. people, yeah, it becomes contentious. Um, yeah, like I'm not my lemma. But anyway, yeah, so this piece as well, more expressionistic, also abstract. I mean, if you, if you just take your hand on your screen and you take away the eye and the lips, it just becomes an abstract painting. Um, so mm -hmm. it's literally placing the eye and the lips in the right position and all of a sudden, boom, you've got an explosion of a painting, you know, uh, which is pretty cool. <clears throat> yeah, this is, uh, I don't know, this painting almost, I love this painting, but there's much sadness in it. Um, uh, also, part of the COVID um, paintings, so I don't know, maybe part of what was going on in my head at that time, not sure. <laughs> well, well I like that one, though. Even though she's sad, I, I like that. Well, it is what's uh, going on. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's a, maybe a longing towards something or a waiting for something, but uh -huh. at least it has, it's like eyes that hasn't given up hope um, yet. <laughs> Yeah, and this piece, um, which I loved, it was yes, it combined so many different techniques of uh, scraping with a scraper, uh, layering paints over one another, and then using a scraper to reveal the bottom pieces of paint um, on the original uh, piece, uh, which I eventually overlaid with the face um, and then um, included that in the piece. Yeah, I love this piece. Beautiful, nice. I love that. I love the colors. And this one, too. 
Yeah, this one's nice. Uh, this, was, this is actually like a like a underpainting which I did. Um, yeah, due to the fact that we started a little bit later, I lost some of my images. Uh, so I wanted to compare this to another piece, uh, do the same piece. But this is an underpainting, and then the final piece uh, was with uh, oil and all my mixed media equipment that I used um, to create the final piece. Yeah, and this piece, uh, this piece, I believe, is on reserve at the moment um, in Switzerland. Um, it's a gallery there. <clears throat> As soon as this whole COVID um, thing just opens up, um, yeah, it's another show that will start that side, which I'm pretty excited about. And then, yeah, this is amazing. This piece, also no title, but the techniques that, that I used in it is so interesting. So I use these rollers with, um, actually, uh, give me a, yeah, well, so it's rollers with, a lot of holes in them and as you brush across the canvas it creates almost like stencil effect with one color so what i did was i used almost four different colors of yellow and blues and oranges etc and then added them on top of one another to create this pixelated effect which eventually transformed into the background that you see there um, and then the eyes and the hand and the lips etc was added um, to bring out the expressionistic side of the abstract painting and then push it into the portraiture um, side of art. That is beautiful. You were going to go get something. What were you going to... Sorry? I thought yeah, you were no. going to... Okay. I, I wanted to show you the different brushes, but um, actually they are all wet um, and being okay. cleaned them. So it's not going to... Yeah, I was like... Okay. And the last one, this is, it's, it's interesting. So this was one of the first pieces that I did during lockdown. Um, and I love it for the reason that it, it, it references the difference in colorization in your eyes. Um, so you'll notice that one eye is more green and the other one has got a more amber, purplish, reddish color to it. You know, and again, if you just take out the eyes, and the nose, it just becomes almost like a, a scribble and with with all different crayons and um, oil pastels and stuff. But as soon as you add the eyes and the nose and the, and the, and the hand, it just becomes something completely different. Um, yeah, one of my personal favorites, which I believe has now been nominated for another Global Art Award. Um, so, yeah, holding thumbs. Uh, uh, yeah, I just... I love that one. So I'm going to have to, I'll keep sharing your link for the, for the award. Thank you. Yeah. Thank that's you. beautiful. That's, that's the images that I've got um, on the sharing platform. Okay. Let me bring me and you back in to the. Yeah. Okay. But those are beautiful, Janko. I really do like everything that you're doing. So I'm excited. Uh, uh, really it's so nice to be able to now you know, do the sculptures and the painting together because it's, again, as I said, the time-wise, to be able to fulfill it with time well spent is so much more rewarding um, than sitting on your ass and watching Netflix, you know. Yeah, oh yeah. So what are, <laughs> give me, tell me again, what are some of the mixed medias you're using in most? So if I walk into my studio in the morning and start with a painting, it is... I've got an idea where I want to go, but I literally use everything that I use on sculptures as well, which is quite interesting because on the sculptures, I'll use different kind of spray paints and car paint and stuff that's really durable to uh, withstand the weather, etc. cetera. And um, when it comes to the mixed media portion of it, I literally, yeah, as I said, I use everything. Um, from the, this is awesome paint that I started using. It's a metal paint that's got really small particles of um, metal inside the paint. Um, it's so small that you can't see it. But as soon as you paint it on and you spray some kind of oxidization on it, it turns color by almost rusting the small particles of, 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 of steel inside the paint. So I love incorporating that because it creates a whole unpredictable genre behind it because you put it on, then you spray it, and you're not exactly sure what's going to happen. You've got an idea, but you're not sure, you know? And then um, 
uh, stuff like um, shellac, which everybody knows about, or I suppose most people, and they use it to varnish wooden objects usually. But uh, I started using it as well as a, as a color, and you can actually um, dominate the thickness thereof, which is pretty interesting. And when I researched what, what the hell is the shellac, uh, which I found is, is it's the <laughs> discretion of a, the shellac beetle. So they literally use the shellac beetle species in really small quantities and then collect it and then produce this substance that, that artists and, well, uh, yeah, in various industries, I suppose, use. Um, so I'm not sure how environmentally friendly it is, but yeah, it's wow, I found it quite interesting. Um, are all these are, are all these on canvas that you're yeah they're all on canvas and um, also so what i do is i i when i paint or project the image that i want to paint on my canvas i like to work not on a stretched canvas um, but on a wooden background that gives me that gives me the um the ability to to use tools on the canvas without pushing through the canvas so i can scratch off and i can push really hard with crayons and with oil pastels and stuff without damaging the canvas at all and then only after i've completed the painting uh, i will uh, get, let it get stretched oh okay so it's mounted on wood while you work on it and then yeah yeah you know, i just use staples to, in the corners um which is yeah. easy to take out I and mean, obviously, uh, we do. I selectively, I, I, I'll do prints of certain paintings, as you will know. Yeah. Well, um, but I know that you. It sounds like those some of those subjectivity scripts that you did during COVID do is a bit of a reflection of what's going on in the world. And did you find it difficult at all to be inspired during, especially in the beginning when it was such a shocker for everybody? Yeah, true. I, it was a shocker for everybody. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Um, I mean, I, I don't think I necessarily go out and look for something that I find interesting that I want to reflect back in my paintings that's happening mm -hmm. in the world today. But obviously it happens subconsciously um, and gets, gets pushed through in your work. Um, but when I sit down and create something or when I start, I like to create something that I personally find stimulating. Uh, actually, I, I like to, to find it cool um and something that i will you know put my money in and buy um so it needs to be interesting but no not necessarily reflections i think as soon as you become re truly reflective of your world you almost become more of a political artist um right yeah uh, yeah so that's not really what i want to do <laughs> Yeah, it's not my, it's not my political art has never attracted me. So, yeah, yeah. So I, I like what you're doing. But, you know, I like the fact that you don't believe in following what is popular in art. And I read that somewhere on your website. Can you share why you feel this way and what path do you follow? Absolutely. That you, you know, yeah. to be honest with you, I think it's completely impossible to not be, um, influenced uh, by popular art or by, by by trying not to believe in following popular art but if you start doing it on a almost a religious level which a lot of people do your own product that you create becomes a monotonous duplication of the same thing and it becomes over and over and over and over you know um, and before you know it <clears throat> yeah you just you, you just another almost part of the machinery of of, of, of the earth so what I try and do is to, because as I said, it's almost impossible not to be interested, but to try, not, to try and steer as far away from it. I love to go and venture into nature. So I almost wanted to call it the path of nature, you know. Um, and by being there, it's, it's almost like it's impossible for nature to be monotonous um, because everything in nature is so unpredictable. So by being there in nature, that's n not monotonous, that's unpredictable, 
I hope that that will somehow influence me and my work and what I create to be a resemblance thereof. Well, I mean, I think you, your work does do that. I think because today, you know, you do have to stand out and your, your work, all your work stands out. And, um, but how it's one of, you don't you don't seem to let it influence your style and you pretty much stick with what moves you versus what others are doing how do you keep focused on that because there is so much with the internet today we see so much i know in photography sometimes i, I get when i feel frustrated it's when i feel like that i don't want my work to look like everybody else's you know and you see exactly. so much out there and you're like, well, how can I stand out? And I really try not to, I guess I don't like following trends. I'd rather be the set of trend more to speak, but it's that right. absolutely. Yeah, well, that's what one tries to try and do. Um, but um, it's, uh, you know, I think for me personally, what I try and do is to travel a lot um, mm -hmm. by traveling, spend a lot of time with different cultures. Um, I also like traveling to not necessarily your mainstream areas of life, um, even though, I mean, they are all fantastic, but I would prefer venturing to some kind of country of the West Coast of Africa, or uh, that's why I did the whole hike to Everest Base Camp, is to, to go into Kathmandu and experience that whole culture, which is um, pretty amazing. So traveling for me definitely plays a big role um, in focusing my kind of lifestyle and, and not being like dragged into the whole popular art vibe, you know? So I'm a firm believer that if you want to create something new, you need to let your soul and your mind and your being experience new things, you know, and to see and see new things and smell new things. I mean, smell is one of the strongest um, senses that we've got. It can take people back 30 years with it in an sure. instant. So I think that is exactly what you should focus on in order to keep your stuff fresh. And I suppose um, also one needs to be honest with, your, with yourself. Um, one needs to look at your own work and be able to judge it accordingly, um, not not look at it and just go, fuck, that's amazing, you know, but actually look at <laughs> yeah. the technical side of it and also the side of were you, how much were you, pop, were you influenced by popular culture and this and that and, you know, and eventually find a balance between all of that and then accept that and then eventually almost give birth to that painting uh, towards the public because that's when you actually say, listen, this is what I produced. Uh, have a look at it. I hope you like it. Right. No, I think yeah. that sounds great. Because I read recently somewhere, and I wish I could remember where I read this. I may have just been Googling something in my research. That, um, and this is not the exact words, but someone had said art has become almost complacent or something like I, I'm not sure. I interpreted that they were saying it's there's nothing really different out there, and um, but I I think part of that is with the internet, and so we have to find more ways to stand out. So you really kind of already answered that, but um, yeah, but you know it's it's interesting. I mean, the I I can completely see where they are coming from as well. You know it's. Um, if you if you look at, for instance, um, different popular art scenes that has been done, it has now been done over and over and over, right? Um, but which is what the sad part is that you know an artist still wants to maybe do that which is portrayed in popular culture, but now all of a sudden almost gets withheld of that opportunity to do that because popular culture is all of a sudden made popular where he maybe have thought it was his own, right? So it definitely yeah. takes away from from artists um, in general, um, I believe. But um, I agree. One needs to put much more into 
the your business as an artist um, in order to be not monotonous, you know, and um, to use all your resources that you've got to your ability um, and or availability, and um, experiment constantly because the freshness behind the art scene, in my opinion, is people that experiment and freestyle almost within their own genre, right? And then accidentally stumbles onto something which is fucking amazing. And then you go, wow, that is sick. I'm, and then you stick with that. But you could have maybe spent a couple of years doing a, a lot of bull, which didn't really get anywhere. But by constantly experimenting, it's, it's, it, that's when the wow moment happens uh, for an artist because you, you stumble onto it. You don't look for it. It just happens because you are experimenting. Yeah, in my yes, I, yes yeah. I agree. Another artist I had interviewed was talking about happy accidents. That's what she called it. So. Absolutely. That's not what all parents will say, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But since I first interviewed you years ago, you've also ventured into a lot of different types of sculptures now too, using bronze versus seaweed. What what kind of moved you into that? And uh, do you still enjoy working with seaweed? Yeah, so seaweed for me, I suppose was my, um, what, what pushed me a little bit further than your usual artist. It's almost like the, on, to latch onto your previous question is that experimenting, experimenting, and yeah. then I'm experimenting with seaweed, and all of a sudden, no one has ever done that in the fashion that I've done it, and people loved it, and poof, all of a sudden, an art career exploded from that, you know. But um, so the seaweed versus bronzes, I'm going to explain it to you um, in a in a fashion to maybe better understand it, and. So all sculptures that any artist make, uh, you first do it from either clay or um, wood or uh, whatever your um, your general main substance would be. So what I did was I took the kelp, which was dried, um, and combined that with conventional um, uh, sculpture techniques by putting clay in the right places etc and now that whole piece eventually once you've done that by incorporating the clay and the natural elements that needs to be molded before it can be cast into bronze or any other substance so then you need to apply a rubber and then a casing with fiberglass and then you open that up and you take the original sculpture which you made out of that and you put it aside, and then you start painting the the actual mold that you made with resin, etc. Which then eventually uh, you do your the sculptures that you will see behind me. It's all resin, but bronze in, in, on the other end um, is is again a completely different scenario. Um, you know that you use the same mold, but you, you use a, a wax, like a wax that you can like a candle. And you paint the whole sculpture with the wax, and eventually you use that wax to throw the um, the melting bronze into the the, the 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 mold that you made for that. And eventually the wax settles and the bronze stays, and then you've got a bronze sculpture. You know, so the process is just insane that you use for different kinds of things. Um, and again, that brings it back to the whole idea. And as an as a sculptor, you tend to have a lot of time with your hands. In between. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. No, Next that's time. great though, because I didn't know that. I didn't realize there was that much time span in between before you could get back to it. So, yeah. So it's good you are painting, because then you can move into that while you're waiting. You know. Exactly. Yeah, so I think that's great. I really do. But the elders collection is about, I was reading this about the Dinka people, which I, I, I Google that and that they live along the Nile, I think is what um, the, the Nile area. And what is it about these people that inspires you and have you spent time around them much or? So, yeah, so my elder series, I think was my second, the second series that I did. Um, 
in my professional career. And I haven't, unfortunately, been spending time with them. I wish I could, but unfortunately, their country has been um, at the straw, just distraught in a lot of civil warfare, and it is not really safe to go there. Um, mm. But they've got amazing wildlife um, to, to such an extent where their civil warfare has been going on for, I, I don't know, I'm talking under correction, but almost 30 or more years. And in that time period, we thought that one of the white rhinos that was on Earth went extinct. And it was actually found a couple of years ago in, in Sudan, hiding between the bushes. They found an extinct rhino. Which, we, which the whole world thought was extinct. So we had the black rhino and the white rhino and then the rhino from India. And this was a completely different rhino. Um, I think it's called the southern something uh, rhino. But anyway, amazing. So uh, do I want to go there? Yes. Can I go there now? Probably, but I'm not necessarily going to take the chance, you know. Um, but yeah, so what, what, what was interesting for me is that so they, they're some of the tallest people in Africa, they literally... <laughs> Yeah, they outshine every tribe in Africa, uh, which makes them quite amazing. Um, and they've got bizarre ceremonial things that they do. Okay, ceremonies. Um, so, for instance, that what they do is they they cut they cut people's flesh with 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 knives um, to create open wounds, and then they use. Um, the blood and the color, uh, different colors of sand to rub into the wounds and create facial um, tattoos to a certain extent, um, but all, all about scarring. And they create these incredible, intricate patterns on their face and arms and legs, etc. And while they are cutting these people, the, the villagers. Um, for lack of a better term, sorry, I don't want to seem derogatory, but they also paint their faces uh, in these beautiful colors, um, which I, so when I first saw this, it was on a documentary, and I, um, I, I was completely blown away by it because the nearest that I've come to experiencing something like this was in South Africa with our own um, native native people um, that's part of our, our group is, is the Shangan people and they've got a beautiful tradition of putting tattoos on their face by using hot coals from the fire and they'll, they'll first put exactly what they want to put on, on the face, they'll lay it out on a piece of metal and patternize it and then put the subject down and then put the hot coals very fast in the right positions and then that creates like a burn with the whole blister and then they use ash from the fire which they took the coals from and they rub it into the blister which opens the blister up but again immediately that forms almost like an ink uh, that draws into the skin and uh, it was beautiful um i I've tried many times to get one of those tattoos, but um, they don't want me to get one. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've tried, I've tried. But not on my face. I'll get one somewhere on my body. But, yeah, oh, shit. Amazing culture. Again, uh, one should have so much respect for the different cultures in life because they've got their traditions and we don't necessarily always understand them, but they mean a lot to the people. And, yeah, for me... Uh, as a conservationist, uh, I definitely respect it at, to, to the utmost. That's amazing, and they have all these masks, and you, ha you, they're these masks. Are they worn in these rituals that they they do? Or? So masks in general, which I find quite interesting, obviously has or have different meanings depending on where you come from in the world. I mean, people from Bali, there's people from Africa, and people from South America, and people from the Americas, all have different meanings with the different masks that, that they use in their ceremonies. But what they all have in common, I think, is that the idea behind a mask is to hide your identity, your feelings, and your emotions, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, it became a symbolic, almost allegorical kind of thing how we as human beings 
live our daily lives. Um, we do not live it properly, in my opinion. We live it with masks. You will wake up and you'll put on your mask. Hello, good morning. And that's yeah. your fucking morning mask, you know. And then you go to office and you're like, hi, this is my coffee mask. Ha, ha, ha. And <laughs> this is my this mask. And, you know, now I'm pissed off. But, I mean, where's the original person behind the mask? You know, does that person actually ever come out? Or does that person only come out when you go to bed and sleep? You know? yeah. It's like, yeah. Sad. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's just like when, it's like when we meet someone, when you're single and you meet someone, you put on this different face. And oh, yeah. I was telling somebody not long ago, I said, well, when I meet someone, why can't I just be who I really am? Why do I, why, if I don't, I just start out with all my, let my name. <laughs> no, my just throw the whole bag of luggage at them. <laughs> and then if they still want to see me again, then I'll know they must really like me. <laughs> <laughs> I you. way to do it. <laughs> but I don't know. Like, it probably would not work. <laughs> but but <laughs> some of you, but you have these. You you some of your sculptures are masks, right? You have that mask collection. Yeah. 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 yeah so, I mean. Um, I've actually been collecting masks my whole life. Um, I've all with all my travels that I go to. I'm actually looking at them now. I've almost I've got almost 20, 20 different masks um, in my studio, and every single one comes from a different country and a different experience, um, etc., which I've had. And I uh -huh. think the last one is um, a Gan Ganesh, which is the Hindu elephant um, god which I bought in a really, really small town way up in the mountains in the Himalayas called um, Dingbochi. And the reason the sculpture is probably only about 15 centimeters or the mask, but it's the only thing that I could um, afford to put in my backpack. Um, but so, yeah, it's amazing. So um, some people find masks and I don't want to say intimidating or demonic or weird, but yeah, most people don't like masks. Um, I think they're actually afraid of their own personalities and what they are masking themselves behind their demeanor or persona. Yeah, exactly. No, I love masks, and I had, I've got a little collection. It's it's much different, I'm sure, than yours because mine are more like masquerade masks, but. I, you know, I wanted to expand it a little and then do some different photography with them. And so um, I, I like masks. I really do. So, you know, I would probably like your collection, I'm sure. So. <laughs> uh, if you can visit in South Africa, I'll take you around. Okay. <laughs> well, you get, so you get a lot of your inspiration for outdoors and, and nature and all that. What would you say most inspires you about it? You know, is it the solitude or? For me, definitely, most definitely. So I, I find solace in nature. Um, you know, it's, if you compare where I go to with your daily life, it is you're constantly being approached with questions and things you need to do and opinions and this and that but in nature if you go to in proper nature you are the guest which is so nice because you can go and sit down and just observe and take it all in you don't need to talk you don't need to do anything if you just sit down and listen to the sounds and if you look in any direction you will find something amazing uh, to occupy your mind with um, so for me, it's that, it's that kind of quality. Um, it's also, if I look at what I do from spending time in nature, in my art, is I use a lot of color, color combinations. Um, mm -hmm. which, you know, I will be hiking and I will see a, a rock that's got um, different algae on it. And the algae would be green and yellow and even a bit of blue in it um, and then with the rock being brown I'll take that photograph and I'll use that um, in my pieces yeah yeah no I love I, I like algae I, I do too there's a lake here it's when it gets all that on it I see all the colors and I think it's really pretty actually so 
amazing. Yeah. But you and you're doing a lot of adventures, a lot of trekking adventures. Is that giving you lots of inspiration? Or is it do you find it harder to get inspiration when you're in groups of people like that? Or so yeah, you know, it's it's difficult. So I, I definitely prefer solitude um before groups of hiking. But hiking in a group has its own advantages as well, you know. Um I think for me personally. I, I prefer to be trekking with less people than with more people. Um, and also, when you trek, do proper treks, um, I don't actually think too much. Um, I actually try and take in more than to think. Uh, you know, if you think, you're constantly almost blocking whatever is outside trying to get in because you are thinking about other things, you know? So I try and shut down with the thinking and just be a sponge and take it all in, um, which I think in the end helps a lot with the artistic process of combining the colors, um, um, et cetera, you know? But yeah, I think trek, if you put it in a trekking fashion, I think there's, a, there's an old African proverb, if I can get it correct, uh, that goes, if you want to go far, go in a group. But if you want to go fast, go alone. So I think I prefer something in between the two. <laughs> right, exactly. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I'm curious, since, since you are doing a lot of paintings and you still do the sculptures, what, what usually inspires you in any given moment um, to create a sculpture, sculpture versus a painting like does an idea come to you and you go well i think that'll work better in a painting or or how does that work is it just uh, sculptures the way i use i do sculpting in my work and i all this is i i almost without sounding macabre i see body parts um when i'm in nature so i'll look at a, a rock or a piece of branch or whatever and i'll see a shoulder or i'll see a piece of jaw with a piece of, um, um, you know, chin coming out or whatever the case may be. And then I usually try and work with the natural element and then try and enhance what I saw by using conventional sculpting techniques, by adding clay and all those kind of things. And then eventually ending up with your end result, which is a combination between conventional sculpting and taking from nature and just incorporating it by telling, showing people what you saw, right? Um, and in painting, it's completely different because even though you do see body parts, I don't see body parts in that, in that way, you know? So for me, it's a lot about the person's eyes, um, the person's hands, the features that they have. Um, if I find someone um, inspirational i would uh, ask to take a photograph of them and then possibly use it in a future work right well with your you've got a lot of beautiful color combinations too does that are you more some are very vibrant and some are more subdued are you more of an in the moment with your color or does that or is that planned ahead so i try and use my color according to the emotion that the painting is starting to show, you know, it's almost, it's, it's, it's difficult to decide before and I'm going to do this and just stick with it. Um, I've done, I mean, usually if that is your process, you, well, I usually end up not being too happy with the end result. Mm -hmm. But if I use the subject within the subject matter and I let the, the paint and the eyes almost not control me, but let it guide itself. It becomes much more natural uh, looking. And yeah, sometimes it becomes bright. And sometimes it goes subdued. Um, yeah, I've got no theory except for following what it wants to do. It's got its mind of its own. Yeah. Uh, um, well, I was curious too, is, are you a meditator? Do you ever meditate? I you know, I wish I, I was able to tell you that I wake up every morning and do like three hours of yoga and meditation. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, unfortunately, I wish. But um, I do wake up early. I try and wake up at 5 a.m. every day. 
which gives me a little bit of room before the kids wake up for school, just to plan my day, decide what I'm going to do, how I'm going to approach it, um, you know, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, yeah, I've got, I got bought this amazing um, brass and bronze and metal healing bowl in Nepal, which you are supposed to put on your head and then bang it, bang, it does like this vibration. And then your whole body is go into sync, right? But um, I've got it there, but I was planning to show it to you guys, but I, it, it's, it really lo looks ridiculous um, because you look like a mushroom on top of your well, head. I don't care. You can look no, ridiculous. <laughs> it's, it's, it might be something that's better suited to Google afterwards. So. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, yeah, meditation is key. I, it has everybody needs to do it. Absolutely. Oh yeah, I, I'm gonna have to try that. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Well, since I've seen you, and in, in it's been five years. So, I'm, what would you say you've learned the most about yourself and your art as an artist? What have you learned about yourself as an artist and just as a person, as a man? You know, through your the last few years, through your well, like through, man, your art, through your art and your adventures you've been doing. Absolutely. Well, I've definitely come to terms with the fact that uh, mortality is something that approaches every person really fast. And it's something, your own health is something that you need to really look after. Um, I mean, I do love smoking and drinking and all doing all those crazy stuff, but it's something that's been more on my, on, on the foreground, you know, as you grow older, as you say, in five years time, for me, a lot has happened um, in between. And as an adventurer, you need to look after your body. You need to train constantly, you have healthy body, healthy mind, healthy spirit, I suppose, you know. But um, since I last saw you, so much has happened. Uh, but I think the biggest lesson that I have learned in that was that your art is only maybe 30% um, and 70% of that is your business. And you need to be business savvy in order to be an accomplished artist. So there's a lot of artists that's that's truly amazing, you know, um, that just don't get anywhere uh, or do not get the recognition. But it's not that they not do not get the recognition; it's that they don't have the business savvy to promote themselves and to actually know how to budget and you know accomplish your tasks that you need to set out uh, on a daily basis. Um, for you know, sculpture for instance, is a really expensive hobby, if that's where you're going to start off with. Um, bronzes cost an arm and a leg. That's why it's so expensive to collect. But the lifetime of a bronze is forever. I mean, we still sit with bronzes from the Greek dynasties and from the, from the Egyptian dynasties, um, which means that bronzes can last for more than 2,000 years, which is amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. Yeah. yeah. No, so that's that's good advice though. Is there is there a dream place that you would like to exhibit your work that I know because you Yeah. Sorry. You, you've got work several places now. I do. Uh, you know, exhibiting work is there a dream place? Yes, obviously, I think you would love to exhibit in the best gallery in the world, you know, in, in the States and in Europe and in Africa and where else, you know. But to get there, also what I've seen is not a jump to stardom. It is a, it is a slow process which every artist needs to climb. You know, you've got a ladder and there's certain steps that you need to do in order to eventually exhibit Am I back? Yeah. I lost you there for a second. Am I yeah, you're back. In order to so, exhibit. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I actually lost my train of thought there. But um, so you said is there a... Sorry, yes. 
you were saying you have to go to get there. You have to go through the process of going up the steps to get to the. And you get people that want to um, almost bypass certain steps and take shortcuts. But as fast as the shortcut is, they usually also fall down the ladder that fast because that's what I've learned also in the time since I've last seen you is that there, there are no shortcuts. All there is is hard work, determination, and never ever to give up. Right. That's, but that, yeah, that's good advice, though. But I can tell you've learned a lot of, you've grown a lot over the last few years. I mean, your work shows it and just. Thank you. It's your adventure, so I mean, I see a lot, so I think that's good. You know, I think you you have oh, learned. Yeah, so. you never stop learning, I suppose, right? Right. Well, what does your family think about your work? Uh, my family, I suppose, you have to ask them. Um, I think that's. <laughs> 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 but they support me one hundred percent, and such a pleasure to have that. Um, and to have them as part of my family you now. Yeah. Do you Love. see artistic abilities in your kids at all? Yeah, I suppose. Um, you know, it's not something that you want to push in any way, but uh, if they do show natural talent towards it, it's something that I would um, would like to help them to develop uh, if they do want to. Right. Well, what what has helped you over the years the best? especially after just what we talked about, to get your work out there? Is it social media or is it more by the exhibits that you do? Or Yeah, you know, Tamara, I think it's all of the above to a certain extent. Uh, you know, you need to be actively exhibiting to be active in the art world, right? Then you also need to be active on social media because that is the latest platforms i mean instagram um, last year sold a couple of billion rand a uh, billion dollars worth of only on their platform so I, i've seen interviews of people saying it, it it is yeah so you also need to look at constantly updating your website um, so you need to be actively involved in everything that you do you know marketing uh, like as you asked, word of mouth. Yes, I suppose word of mouth has always been the most powerful tool in marketing, um, even above the internet. You know, to a certain extent, because you only need to speak to the right person, and your whole world can change. But then again, the flip side of that is that your post on the internet can also just land on the right person's profile page, and the same can happen. So, I think it's all of the above. You need to take all things into consideration um, do take two hours in the morning to do social media do your website updating do your marketing do all the things you need to do before you actually go into your studio and start creating art because as i said it's almost 70 percent of the art world is or successful artists is based on that they have a successful business business yeah you're right and that's the social media is it is very time consuming and I that's <laughs> it drains me sometimes. I'm like, God, what happened? What did we do before this? You know, but. right, exactly, exactly. That's also why I love going to to the farm in nature and stuff, is because there aren't any on any of these these things like social media and even electricity. I mean, where I go to, there's no electricity. So you light a candle and if the candle is out, you're done. You need to go to bed. I mean, um, yeah. <laughs> which is great, you know, because you tend to, your whole, your whole mindset shifts from turning into bed at 11 by turning into bed at like 8.30 and you wake up at like 4.30 because you don't need to wake up at 8 o'clock. So everything changes, you know. Exactly. Well, I think it's great. That's my distraction is going to the horse farm because I, nice. Nice. I, I have to get away from all the distractions of the phone and the social media. It's just, um, yeah. Well, Janka, I could keep you here all day, but um, 
I, I really want to thank, I know you got stuff to do. I want to thank you again for being here today. I, I really have enjoyed your work over the years. Is there anything else that you want to mention or announce um, that we didn't cover or that's important to you? I can just say thank you for the time and the interview. It's always a pleasure spending time with you. You're a great host. And um, in, I'll probably see you in what, in five years time again? Yeah, hopefully not that long. I would love for you to come come here to my area. I'm going to have to figure out how we're going to do that. So I'd love no, to. I'll yeah. Yeah, I'll yeah. yeah, I'll figure it out. I'd love for you to have an exhibit here. So we'll have to work on that. Um, but I, then I also but thank you for being here. And, and I want to thank the viewers for their continued support. Make sure you share this replay of my interview with Janko. And his website is jankodebeer.com. And I'll have that under the, the video, the YouTube video replay. He's also on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And join me again in two weeks for my live interview with a local actor, Michael Williams, who stars in a short film called Kill Giggles. And to your own success, just keep on living and keep on rocking it. And see you in a couple of weeks. Okay, Jay.